start reading now? Yes, you should. Okay, I should start reading now. This is the fifth Sunday after Pentecost. And our lessons this morning describe for us the marvelous things God has done for us. In our first lesson, we have a portion of the writings of the prophet Isaiah. And it would appear that God in this passage is offering both a promise of hope and a word of judgment to the Israelites who have been exiled and are living in Babylon. We're talking about five to six hundred years before Jesus. Some of the folks came back when they were released, but not all. And so this poem actually is divided into verses or stanzas, and it describes for us the nature of God and his complaint against the people. He promises that they will return to him, to their land, that he will accomplish this for them. But he also lets them know that he is not entirely happy with them. The whole point of God giving them the law and describing for them all those rituals and ceremonies we read about in the books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy were set in place so that when the Hebrews occupied the land of Israel, their behavior would be distinct and apart from everything else around them. I recall early in my Navy career, but after about three or five months or so, my language had become just a little bit, shall we say, salty. <laughs> and it occurred to me that instead of me being an influence to my sailors and Marines, I had allowed them to influence me and was becoming more like them in terms of the vulgarity of my language and its coarseness. In the same way, God is unhappy with the Hebrews because while they were in Babylon, they allowed some external forces to influence their behavior. Some of them began eating pork. And that's what we read about in the gospel lesson. Pork is taboo for the Hebrew people. In fact, even associating with pigs was forbidden. And so God expresses his displeasure to them. We read from the book of Isaiah, chapter 65, verses 1 through 9. God says, I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. To a nation that did not call on my name, I said, here I am. Here I am. All day long I have held out my hands to obstinate people who walk in ways not good, pursuing their own imagination a people who continually provoke me to my very face, offering sacrifices in gardens and burning incense on altars of brick, who sit among the graves and spend their nights keeping secret vigil, who eat the flesh of pigs and whose pots hold broth of unclean meat, who say, keep away, don't come near me, for I am too sacred for you. Such people are like cigarette smoke in my nostrils, a fire that keeps burning all day. See, it stands written before me, I will not keep silent, but will pay back in full. I will pay it back into their laps, both your sins and the sins of your fathers, says the Lord, because full payment is due for their former deeds. This is what the Lord says. As when juice is still found in a cluster of grapes, and men say, don't destroy it, there is yet some good in it, so will I do in behalf of my servants. I will not destroy them all. I will bring forth descendants from Jacob and from Judah, those who will possess my mountains, my chosen people, 
who will inherit them, and there will my servants live. Here ends the first lesson. Our psalm for this morning, a portion of Psalm 22, is a prayer of lament for deliverance from mortal illness. The lesson begins with a prayer for healing, pleading for Yahweh's presence and deliverance. He concludes with a vow of the sick one to offer a formal thanksgiving in the temple for recovery. Reference to fear of the Lord, the Hebrew word yare, does not cut out being terrified or afraid of God, but rather it's a Hebrew phrase meaning worship and obedience. The whole setting is that of someone who lives in a relationship with God. Please turn to page 224 in the front of the hymnals. We'll read Psalm 22 responsibly and tiffinally. I'll read the first half of the verse up to the asterisk. You read the second half. We'll begin at verse 19 and read through verse 28. Save me from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, my wretched body from the horns of wild bulls. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. Praise the Lord, you that fear him. Stand in awe of him, O offspring of Israel. All you of Jacob's line give glory. For he does not despise, nor abhor the poor in their poverty. Neither does he hide his face from them. But when they cry to him, he hears them. My praise is of him in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the presence of those who worship him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied, and those who seek the Lord shall praise him. May, May your heart live, live forever. forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nation shall bow before him. For kingship belongs to the Lord. He, he rules, rules over the nations. nations. To him alone all who sleep in the earth bow down in worship. All, All will go, go down, down to, to the, the dust, dust fall, fall before him. We continue our series of lessons from Paul's letter to the congregations in the Galatian territory. Coming from Tarsus, which was a Gentile city, Paul knew what it was like to live as a Jew in a foreign context, much like we heard about in our first lesson. There was a minority group in the Galatian territory who opposed Paul and his teachings. And so Paul here is probably offering to us his most decisive statement that faith in Jesus Christ has removed all barriers to a relationship with God and with one another for all those who believe. Certainly in a time such as ours, where people have all sorts of barriers that we use to separate us from one another, where tragedies like Orlando or so many other places emphasize that hatred and divisiveness, Paul, whom everybody assumes was a male chauvinist pig, because he wrote to the Corinthians and said women should not have positions of authority over men. Here in the Galatian passage puts men and women on an equal plane. In the letter to the Galatians, chapter 3, verses 23 to 29, St. Paul writes, Now before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. For in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. 
as many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ Jesus, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Here ends the second lesson. We talk about being a follower of Jesus. And in the past couple of weeks, perhaps we've been given a reason to question why we might want to do that. Groucho Marx was once quoted as saying, he would never belong to any country club that would accept him as a member. <laughs> in the past couple of weeks, we've seen Jesus have a relationship with a hated Roman, a centurion who actually was a man of faith. We heard last week about Jesus' encounter with a fallen woman, one of those bad people. And now this morning, he comes in contact with a demon-possessed man. Let's set the scene. Jesus is in Capernaum on the west side of the lake. Whether for a whim or a purpose, Luke does not record. But Jesus says, let's go across the lake. So they get in the boat and they go across the lake. Now we're not talking a little lake. I have visited with our children in Evanston, Illinois, right on the shores of Lake Michigan. We've gone down to Lighthouse Beach, and you can't see the other side of the lake. It's like you're looking at the ocean. It's a long trip. And so Jesus lays down to take a nap. But as often happens on the Sea of Galilee, where storms can come up very quickly, a bad storm occurs raining and the wind is blowing and they've had to take down the sails for fear that they're going to be torn and the boat is rocking and swamping and filling with water and Jesus is sound asleep in the back. So the disciples wake him up. Master, don't you care that we're dying here? Now I don't know about you and I take comfort in this passage because sometimes when I take a nap if I get up too quickly I'm grumpy. It's not like I wake up, oh boy, am I refreshed. I just had a four-minute nap. No, I wanted a 40-minute nap. Jesus wakes up, and maybe he was a little grumpy. He looks at the disciples and says, what's wrong with you? Where is your faith? And then he speaks out to the wind and the wave. Be still. Be serene. It's the translation. And immediately, the wind stops, and the water is smooth, and the disciples are stunned. And they ask one another, who is this guy that even the wind and the sea obey him? So they come to the other side of the lake, to the land of Gennesaret, and immediately they are greeted by a demon-possessed man. Now Luke records for us that this man was such a threat to other people that they would keep him chained. But yet so strong was his demon possession that he would break the chains. He never wore clothes. And he lived in the cemetery amongst the tombs. And as we heard in the Old Testament lesson, Jewish people are to have no contact with the dead, except under very special circumstances. So the fact that this man has been living with the dead is a reason for the disciples to want nothing to do. Yet Jesus immediately commands the demons to leave him. The man responds with a question that we sometimes ask of God. What do you want me to do? How would you have me live? Jesus.
Jesus asks for the identity of the man, and he replies, Legion, for we are many. Now, a Roman legion was a company of some 600 Roman soldiers. We don't know for a fact that there were 600 demons, but there was a lot of them. And so Jesus commands the demons to leave. And they plead with Jesus, no, uh, let us go into the pigs. Do not send us into the abyss. And if you know your scripture, there are several passages, most notably Revelation chapter 20, verse 3, which speaks of the abyss as a deep, bottomless pit into which Satan will eventually be thrown for eternity. And so these demons do not want to be sent there. The next passage quite honestly mystifies me because Jesus agrees and says, okay, go occupy the pigs. They do. The pigs go mad, rush down the hillside, over the cliff, and into the lake where they drown. Symbolically, there is some irony here. The demons didn't want to go to the abyss. They wanted to continue their life so they could continue to torment people. Jesus sends them into the pigs, and the pigs jump into the abyss, the water, where the pigs drown, and the demons no longer can have any interaction with people. What a marvelous story. Please rise for the good news of the gospel. This is the gospel according to Luke, the 8th chapter, beginning at the 26th verse. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus and his disciples arrived at the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. As he stepped out on land, a man of the city who had demons met him. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he did not live in a house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wilds. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? He said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now there on the hillside was a large herd of swine feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swine herd saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demon had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the demons had been healed, for the man possessed by demons had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Let's be seated and we'll sing our next hymn. 